sorry, Snuggles. Are you okay? Ugh, at least we didn't break the camera. We'll have to try going viral another time. This obviously didn't work. Welcome back, cool cats and cat allies alike, to Six Degrees of Cats, the world's best and only cat-themed culture, history, and science podcast. When I started talking about Six Degrees of Cats, this podcast, the reactions were, across the board, you know, optimistic and encouraging. How interesting. That's so... You, Amanda. Oh, yeah. Cats market themselves. This is easy. I mean, obviously, this was going to be a hit. After all, cats are the number one most beloved animal on the internet, right? Kinda. I have a strong case that cats should wear the crown as king of the internet. I can name 20 cat influencers off the top of my head, and I know I'm not the only one. So, truly... I think that cats are the king of the internet. But I guess we have to look at the history first to challenge that hypothesis, if you will. So, in this episode, we're going to be exploring the way our furry friends have catalyzed conversations across the World Wide Web. What is wrong with this modem? Hang on, bear with me. Oh, it was just Snuggles sitting on the modem. All right, we rolling? We are certainly living in a weird moment in time. I don't think this is a unique feeling to our here and now, but I don't think it's controversial to say that we're living in a world beyond our ancestors' wildest dreams and nightmares. We haven't achieved world peace. We haven't solved world hunger. We haven't reversed climate change or ended animal cruelty or housed everyone affordable. But we do have... Wireless Fidelity Wi-Fi. More generally, the internet. Hey, come on now, seriously. The internet. It's amazing. It's great. It's... The heck? Are you kidding me? People think the world's flat? Oh my gosh, I can't even look at that image. That is just racist. Oh, she looks really pretty. Let me just check the comment. Mm, no. What is wrong? With okay, fine. It does look like the internet isn't as civilized a place as it could be, thanks to the amplification and acceleration of only the most extreme, chaotic, and outre voices on there. That's a bit of a bummer. But let's not just all be doom and gloom here. On the whole, I still think things are a lot easier than they used to be. It used to take weeks to send and receive documents for signatures and stuff because we had to use snail mail to send printed items. It would take hours, if not days, to perform research. You'd have to actually go in person to libraries and scan books with your eyes. You had to use the phone, pick up the receiver, put it to your ear, and <laughs> hope that the person on the other end picked up. But now, I can take my laptop anywhere in my home no wires, and connect to potentially 5.3 billion people, over half the world's population, to send pictures and graphics interchange formats, GIFs, GIFs, GIFs uh -huh. in real time. I can chat with someone in, say, Algeria, where this here podcast was once in the top 100. So truly, everything and everyone is connected. A good majority of us, at least. Thanks to that network of subterranean cables and the satellites that communicate to make up the internet. Thanks, U.S. Department of Defense. <coughs> yeah, I, I told you everything's connected. Almost all modern infrastructure and systems we use here in the United States include innovations and technology first developed through war-related stuff. And in this instance, we are talking about the Department of Defense's Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA, who named the very first iteration of the internet ARPANET. That actually could have caught on, ARPANET. Anyway, they launched that in the 1960s. But, you know, let's not give them too much credit. The concept of signals connecting wirelessly isn't new, and you might be surprised by some of the four parents, four mothers, if you will, such as... 
Ada Lovelace, the estranged daughter of none other than English romance poet and total rabble rouser Lord Byron. Ms. Lovelace was a 19th century mathematician and the first computer programmer. And about a century later, none other than Hollywood actress Hedy Lamarr patented a special radio frequency hopping system as part of an effort to support torpedo warfare for the Allies during World War II. So again, a step towards wireless tech, thanks to war. Uh. My pizza delivery. Perfect timing. While the original intent of the internet was to facilitate fast, secure communication, of course, the tools of the internet were quickly found to be very useful in the food trade. Pizza is kind of famously the best food suited for delivery. There was a monetization very early on with like trying to incorporate pizza delivery, the order off the internet. That was pizza expert, or pizza czar, Chef Anthony Falco. I am an international pizza consultant and the author of Pizza Czar. I have a consulting company called Falco Unlimited Concepts with my wife, Rebecca. My Instagram is millennium underscore Falco. It's two L's and two N's. And on my Instagram, I document my travels around the world as a pizza consultant. I've made pizza in 20 countries and counting, and I have a goal to make pizza on every continent. Maybe we should team up on my cat tour of the world. Yes. We are on the same path. It's just one is furry and cuddly and the other is hot and cheesy. The passion for pizza, like the passion for cats, is a global, web-based phenomenon. That gooey, cheesy slice of joy with any and all variation of toppings is the unofficial food of the net. I mean, it's the most Instagrammed food on Earth. I think it's just like something that's universally loved. I mean, a pizza can be adapted to anyone. There's gluten-free pizza. If you're vegetarian, if you're vegan, if you don't eat pork, if you don't eat beef. To understand the evolution of internet culture and its cat-worshipping denizens is to appreciate the rise of pizza. Get it? Rise? Let me see myself out. Anthony served me a slice of world history, starting with his own Sicilian-style personal pan parable. The world had to come together to create pizza. It's the world's favorite food because it belongs to the whole world. No one really owns pizza. My dad's side, they're all Sicilian farmers from Central Texas. My great-grandparents immigrated through New Orleans and settled in Brazos River Valley of Texas, where there was a bunch of Sicilian farming communities. They still have a big San Giuseppe Festival in Bryan, Texas, which is not really on, on a lot of people's radar. I loved pizza as a kid, and my great-grandmother used to make something that she would call pizza, but pizza was a word that she had never heard before because they only spoke Sicilian, which is considered its own language. When they left Sicily, it had only been a part of Italy for a few years, so they didn't even speak standard Italian. We didn't actually describe what pizza is. I think for the purposes of this episode, a pizza is this round slab of baked dough. I don't want to hear a Detroit. What even is Detroit? I never pizza. heard of I am from Michigan. Anyway, we'll say that the common understanding of a pizza is a flatbread, if you will, with layers of sauce, usually tomato-based, plus cheese and toppings, such as corn and mayo. I'm not kidding. Ask the Japanese. And pizza is from Italy. At least that version is. According to my research, the modern-day pizza seems to have originated in the 18th century, sometime around then at least, by the folks in Naples, Napoli. You've heard of the Neapolitan pizza, right? Well, seems like that's the OG pizza. What's so special about this particular delicacy's history, beyond how freaking yummy it is, is that... Pizza is one of the few foods where you can historically say... It started at this time. There's a great book by Michael C. Mann about the pre- and post-Columbian exchange world. 
it's based on a more scholarly book called Ecological Imperialism. It dives into how the exchange of plants, animals, diseases, and humans from the old world to the new world really affects every aspect of every society on Earth. Because wheat and tomatoes were separated completely until the European settlers, explorers, went to Mexico and brought wheat to Mexico and then brought tomatoes back to Europe. So it couldn't have existed before that. There were flatbreads. And you know who was around then? Keeping rodents away from the grains used to bake those breads? I'm pretty sure that cats are old world species. There are native big cats. So there's the cougar and then there's the jaguar, which is also in North America, but less so. It's been pushed out a lot. Um, then there's some small ones like lynx and ocelots. But the domesticated house cat didn't come until possibly Viking ships in the ninth century brought them. I have this image of a cat wearing a little Viking helmet, and it's really just the cutest. Oh, oh my goodness. It just occurred to me. Cats are partly responsible for pizza. Huh? Oh, what? Uh -huh. Okay, that might be a bit of a stretch. Speaking of stretch, stretched dough. Where were we? Ah, yes, those flatbreads. Going back to the Roman times, you can see pizza ovens that are almost identical to the ones that I use today. And they would put fat and meat and olive oil and herbs on them and stuff. But there was no tomatoes. <gasps> you can't have pizza without tomatoes. That's what makes it pizza and not a flatbread. A lot of pizzerias have white pizzas, but there's no pizzeria that doesn't have tomato sauce. I definitely can't think of a pizza without tomato sauce in some aspect of that equation. And please, no ranch. No ranch. Pizza has a lot of Mexican influence, actually. Mesoamerican farmers. Um, domesticated tomato, chili peppers. And? The water buffalo that makes buffalo mozzarella originates from India or East Asia. And they were brought to Italy in the 12th century. So mozzarella actually originates from a species from Asia. Even wheat it originates from eastern Turkey. Really, the only thing native to Italy that's in pizza is olive oil. So pizza is truly an international food. The food of the people. In person and online. Anthony saw firsthand when pizza went virtual. Yeah, I'm very early internet guy. Like I was in high school working on BBSs, which is like a bulletin board system. And that predated the internet. You had to call one website to log on, essentially. That's pretty similar to how the first web-based pizza delivery site worked. Courtesy One Pizza Hut. Located in Santa Cruz, California, USA in 1999. The rudimentary online form was called PizzaNet. Once customers entered their pizza order via a Pizza Builder menu page, someone from that Santa Cruz Pizza Hut would call and confirm that, yes, Seymour Butts is your real name. Why is that funny? And then you'd pay at the door in cash because the technology to pay by credit card for stuff like that wasn't set up. Speaking of paying for pizza, Pizza may have been the very first food purchased with Bitcoin, or at least the most notorious Bitcoin purchase of food. Uh, you'll see what I mean. When Bitcoin first came out, some guy was like, oh, well, what do I do with this? I have Bitcoin now. I don't know what to do with it. Someone buy me a pizza and I'll send them Bitcoin. It was only worth a dollar or something. So like he said... 50 or 60 Bitcoin. The Bitcoin pizza would be worth millions and millions of dollars now that the guy bought. $421 million to be exact. Bitcoin pizza day is like an internet holiday. And that illustrates how pizza is baked into the culture of the internet. So, it's the 90s. We have the basics, food, 
a dial-up internet connection that allowed for 28.8 kilobytes per second to be downloaded, and a place to gather with the random friends we met online who know, Dad, we were not telling them our home address so we could be kidnapped. But what was there to talk about in those early internet days? What were we sharing? How could we bond? What was the lingua franca of the early internet? Come on, we all know who it was. Felis Catus. <laughs> all right, folks, order in a hot tomato pie, throw a piece of chicken at your kitty, and we'll follow that pizza cat. After the break. Oh, that's so cute. I gotta send this to my cat text. Th oh, sorry, I got a little distracted there. Before the break, we learned how pizza took over the internet. Pizza party! Speaking of parties... Ah, isn't it fun on the web? Oh my god, you guys follow Our me for $20 Yikes, never mind. I guess it's more like a bar fight when it's not a bunch of ads or commercials or advertorials shouting at me to, like, buy a bunch of stuff I can't afford. But as I said, it wasn't always this way. The early internet was scrappier, more random, more playful, and full of cuter stuff, like kitties. I had the opportunity to speak to an expert who literally wrote the book on kitties and the internet. My name is Maria Busios. I'm a journalist and editor, the founding editor of Popula and the Brick House Cooperative, which is a journalist-owned publishing platform. You can find me at the Brick dot house, which is where I do a lot of my publishing and editing, and at mariabustios.com. It's my personal website. I'm on Mastodon at Maria at the life dot boats. So the early publicly available web. Ah, the memories. You've got mail. This essay that I wrote in an anthology from Coffee House Press, it was a very fun project about how the internet started out being kind of like a homemade endeavor. At first, it was fun and everybody was having a great time. There was no commercial interaction in it at all. Even on Facebook, when it first became possible for anybody to like get on Facebook, there was a, a box where you could list the things that you liked. Click a button and you would immediately find everybody on Facebook, individual people who had listed the same thing. I like James Thurber and I like cat videos and I like this and that. Indeed, the early internet really was all about connection. And this is where the cats come in. It was cats that connected people across the internet from the get-go. <laughs> There's a few sort of universal human places of connection, and cats and cat videos is one. The thing that's so thrilling about them is a cat can at any moment be about to do something stupid and embarrassing or noble and beautiful, and it's at the same time, right? This is where we're joined together in love of cats. It's like this whole love of the unexpected and excitement Interestingly, it was rodents that actually helped first bring kitties into the space. Why does that sound familiar? I became aware that there were going to be absurd animal videos right at the very beginning of the internet in the mid-90s when I first saw a website called Hamster Dance. It was these like hamsters that were like allegedly dancing. My daughters would like actually do the slow rotating and they would sing, and the few people that were online at that point were just completely obsessed with it. Oh, yes, we were. But of course, we had no bandwidth then. I mean, it was like literally impossible on these modems that we had. You couldn't even send photographs at all. What passed for the internet in my life was a CRT monitor, two colors, kind of green and black. And so it was very exciting when we started to be able to have photographs. 
Everybody put their pets up almost the first possible thing. And this became a bonding mechanism for people all over the world to post pictures of their cats. From scanners to digital cameras to today's smartphones, the trafficking of cute cat photos and stories increased rapidly, as did groups, forums, platforms, and other types of community gathering spaces online for pet owners, admirers, and procrastinators. It was an inevitability that people were going to film cat videos and They just became more and more fun and and silly and funnier. And I would say 2010 to 2015, there was a real sort of golden age of making awesome, ridiculous videos of pets where it was just one person, look at my cat. Yeah, it's this emotional connection to our adorable furry friends that will keep this kind of content alive and flourishing on the web forevermore, or at least I hope. I think that's never going to end. People are always going to love animals and they're going to love seeing other people's animals and they're going to love an animal that gets rescued. And I still see the video of those guys who had the pet lion and I would like watch it a hundred times. We now return to the present, 30 years after hamster dance and those weird homegrown community-driven spaces, random chat rooms or forums or rudimentary pages where you could make best friends with I Love Kittens and Babies 1976, a nice fellow youth, or so you hoped, messaging you from Omaha, Nebraska, well, those spaces disappeared or dissolved. Early web domains like GeoCities and browsers like Netscape gave way to the monolith that is... Google, or Alphabet. Stuff has become more accessible and affordable, like high-speed internet and computers capable of processing more and more information that we can download within seconds, microseconds, into our ubiquitous handheld devices. Not all of this is bad, per se, but... The commercialization of the internet, this is the thing I wrote about in the essay, and I mean, what was evident and slightly troubling and less fun in 2016 in 2023 has just become turbocharged into pure insanity to make money out of it and algorithmize and generate ad views and stuff. There's always 10 computers in the way between you and anything. Less and less is it possible to just find a person that you want to talk to by yourself without a commercial mediation. And so There's a less organic kind of feeling. The World Wide Web has become, well, more and more homogenized and whitewashed. Everything is starting to look and sound similar in all of this search engine optimized driven language. And for many reasons, partly due to the huge population online, as well as this commercialization, it feels very depersonalized almost not as human as it used to be. Look, I'm not saying anything original here. This has been reported on by many, a journalist, researcher, and every single person who says, I can't figure out TikTok. It's intimidating. Sure, the internet is a marketplace, but underneath all of that, it is a community. So I think we really need to value those chaotic, wonderful cat videos, not only because they're cute, but because they really do represent something so special about the culture of the Internet. I like the idea of exploring humanity through something like cats, because I think it is that way with pizza. You know, the more I go around the world, obviously everyone's differences are important and it's hard. We're entering like a global culture where there's a flatlining of a lot of things. But I do think it's still a good thing to think of people as like we are all just humans dealing with the same human problems. And, you know, that all the cats of the world are just cats dealing with their own cat problems. Yeah. And we all need a community, a forum, a place where we can share stories, support, solutions, and when we're able, find the humor in them or our cats' problems, as long as they're not terrible.
in the beginning of the internet, there was pizza and there were kitties. Cats truly are the symbol of the internet. Just pull up your keyboard, you'll see. There are more cat emojis than any other animal emoji. I just want them to make a pizza cat emoji. I think the story of pizza and cats on the internet is a great reminder to stay weird, stay playful, and make the second life we live online a giant cat-filled pizza party. You're doing the world a good thing when you share a cute story or a picture of a cat. So go ahead and do that now. And remember to tag Six Degrees of Cats so we can see it. Thanks, folks. I know it was a real leap from pizza to pussycats. That alliteration got a little edgy there. In the next episode, we'll be continuing our celebration of all things kitty, as it'll be Valentine's Day. We did an episode last Valentine's Day on Cupid and Kitties. Check out that episode if you haven't listened to it already. Then make your own cat Valentine meme. I want to thank my wonderful experts, Maria Busios and Anthony Falco. While the opinions are my own, the research and work is theirs. If you'd like to learn more about them, please check out our show notes, which also include the references and research that went into this episode. If you loved it, please help this pirate ship sail across the World Wide Web by sharing it, writing about it, and giving us a top rating and a review with all those SEO keywords or whatever. Listeners, community members, friends on the internet, I appreciate you. It's always so great to remember that everyone and everything is connected. Six Degrees of Cats is produced, written, edited, and hosted by yours truly, Captain Kitty, a.k.a. Amanda B. Please subscribe to our mailing list by going to l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash six degrees of cats or look us up on all those social media platforms. You'll be first in line for the extra audio and more treats if you connect with us there. All episodes are dedicated to the misunderstood, the marginalized, the resilient, and the weird. And, of course, all the cats we've loved and lost. Tomorrow is the one for me. It's so obvious, but I mean, there's just, I have yet to see another cat star that would dislodge Maru in my heart. He's like the cat version of like Clive Owen for me.